Iman, we are very pleased to have you tonight in this wonderful place. I'd like to mention something about Dr. Helen. I was the first inspector to work with, with them. We were working here at the Metropolis 34 years ago. I was so young. We are so young. <laughs> we still are. <laughs> She's giving a lovely lecture about studying Egyptian coffins from Luxor. Dr. Helen, please. Thank you. It's very lovely to be here, and uh, I'm very grateful to see so many of you at such short notice. It's great. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, working on Egyptian coffins, looking at it from the perspective of coffins, particularly from Luxor, but I will be talking about other coffins too. Um, and this is a project that I'll be talking about that has been worked on by myself and some colleagues in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. So I will be talking a lot about coffins from Cambridge. I apologize. But I will be particularly talking, I hope, about ones from just outside here. And it's fantastic to sort of see the necropolis in the background while I'm talking. So I will also say a lot of things that will be very familiar to you already. Um, so bear with me. I just, I'm not entirely sure what everybody knows. So just to start immediately, when we think about Egypt, uh, very often people immediately think about these things, pyramids, or Tutankhamun, or mummies. These are the three things. If you say to people, ancient Egypt, those are the three things people immediately think of. And in a sense, all of those are on a very similar t theme. They are all related to death, because pyramids are places where kings were buried. Tutankhamun is often said to be famous only because he died, actually, and was found in his tomb. And then there are mummies, which of course are dead people who have been preserved. So a lot of times we think of ancient Egypt as being all about death. So when I'm going to be talking to you about coffins, it may be that you're expecting that I would be talking a lot about death and burial, but I'm not going to really talk about that so much. There has been a lot of work studying mummies, especially using modern techniques like CT scanning. Maybe some of you have had to go to hospital to have a CT scan. And the results are amazing that you can see what's going on inside people's bodies. And traditionally, up till very recently, CT scanning has been used to study the mummies inside the coffins rather than the coffins themselves. And this is an exhibition that was held at the British Museum in 2015, um, all about eight mummies from the point of view of looking at them through CT scanning. But we have been using CT scanning at the Fitzwilliam Museum, this is the museum where I work, in Cambridge. We've been using CT scanning as well as many other <coughs> techniques to actually study the coffins and not what's actually inside the coffins. You could argue that's because most of our coffins are empty. But we wanted to use a technique that would allow us to see the structure of coffins in three dimensions. Because we have used x-raying techniques a lot in the past, but if you know anything about x-rays, you know that they actually flatten everything into one dimension. So when you see um, a particular feature, you cannot tell if it's on the outside at the back the inside at the back, the inside at the front, or the outside at the front. It all is in exactly the same plane. When you start using a CT scanner, you can actually see in three dimensions what's going on inside the structure of the coffin. And in 2016, we had an exhibition at the museum. It was called Death on the Nile. I'm sorry, it's a very funny <laughs> title. But uh, especially because I've said I'm not really going to be talking about death. But... Um, that was the title of the exhibition. And we, we um, used this as an opportunity to display the way that coffins developed over time in ancient Egypt. We started with um, pre-dynastic burials and then we ended up with a Roman mummy inside a red shroud, which was effectively like a coffin. And we showed how over time the Egyptians adapted to the materials that they were working with, how clever they were at 
using the materials to create coffins of great beauty and how they could hide a lot of the, the problems that they were facing with the materials they worked with inside these coffins. So a lot of what I want to talk about is actually about the people who made the coffins. So it's about life and coffins, if you like. It's about the funeral industry in Egypt. And this is a fantastic painting in the tomb of Ipwi in Del Medina. I don't think that's open to the public, unfortunately. I wish it was open to the public because it's got some of the most brilliant tomb scenes in it. But this scene in particular is enormously interesting because it's one of the few representations of people working on coffins. So we can see here uh, two coffins being worked on. There's a man up here using a chisel and uh, there's a man here painting and somebody supporting this coffin. But there are other people here working on other objects for tombs. Um, we can see somebody here working on a funerary mask a bit like, you imagine, the, tomb, the mask of Tutankhamun, if you think of that. Um, we can see here somebody making a decorative element that will go inside a shrine or decorate the outside of a shrine. And in fact, there is a big shrine over here that we can't really see on this picture. There's someone using a saw to cut wood. And up here is somebody actually cutting down a tree. And a lot of what I want to talk about relates to wood and trees. So I'm going to start actually with looking at a coffin that's not from Thebes, I'm afraid, or not from ancient Luxor, but it's a coffin of a man called Henanu. Uh, and it's very early, it's possibly 6th dynasty or 1st intermediate period, and it comes from Asyut. And you can see here that it's a classic early coffin in that it is a rectangular box. It's a long box with no shaping like an anthropoid body. And here we see uh, the exterior that is the face that would be looking to the east. So ideally when this was buried, this face that we see here would be lying towards the east and these eyes would be looking towards the rising sun. The body inside the coffin would have been lying on its side with its head at this end to look out. Now, there are a number of interesting features about this coffin, um, and I will talk to you very quickly about them, but before I get on to the wood. Um, so you can see the inscription here. Um, it's written between two parallel lines, laid out in black, and the inscription itself is also written with a black pen, and then filled in with blue color. But the person writing with the blue color ran out of blue color here. And that's the same actually everywhere on the coffin. And it, this is in fact the name of the tomb owner, Hen, or the coffin owner, Henenu. So is it possible that in fact the coffin was completely inscribed apart from the name, and then the name was added later? Or is it that just that the person who put the blue paint on was not very competent? We don't know the answer to that question. It's an open question at the moment, but it's an interesting feature. If we look at this section of that panel from the, the coffin, we can see that the way that the decoration has been implied was to um, try to manage all the flaws in the coffin by filling them with a bit of paste. We don't use the word plaster. Uh, because we reserve that word only for a particular material like plaster of, of Paris, for example. So we refer to it as paste because it, the constituent of it can be a number of different things. But they've tried to fill in the floors with some paste and then applied a yellow background colour before drawing the lines on and then starting to put on the eyebrows here and the eyes and all these parts of the wedge art eyes that we see here. So once we start looking at the coffins in this way, we immediately start to see the work of the craftsman rather than looking at it from the perspective of what was happening magically inside the coffin and what the point of the coffin was. So it's a different way slightly of looking at coffins. The boards of the coffin have been joined in a way that we call edge 
jointing. So they are, each piece is on edge, and there is a joint here. And we can see in spaces where some, some of the paste has fallen out, we can see how that jointing has happened. This is a piece, an extra piece of wood that we call a tenon, and it sits inside a mortise up here and down here and holds these two planks of wood together. If we look more at this coffin, we see that, in fact, it is made of sycamore fig wood. And you have a lovely sycamore in your garden. Yeah. We have to be very strict about that, though, and call it sycamore fig because it's a ficus sycamorus. Uh, and uh, not what we call a sycamore, it's a different tree altogether in, in, uh, in Europe. It's a completely different kind of tree. So we call this sycamore fig. And this is an example not as beautiful as your tree, but actually it's quite typical of sycamore fig when it gets big and ugly. And we get these very curved branches like this all up here and the wood you can see even in the trunk, it's not very straight grained wood. It's quite difficult to manage and the individual um, pieces of it are very curved very often. And so we see here, if we look immediately, we see this plank is very curved as so is this one and this one. And that's because the way that the Egyptians cut wood was to take a log from the tree like this, maybe a branch, this, and attach it to a post set in the floor and then saw it. And this action by this man here, in, this is the very famous carpenter's workshop from the tomb of Mekhet Re, which was in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It was not there when we were there just the other day. So maybe it's being restored or something, I don't know. Anyway, it wasn't there, so you couldn't see it. However, in this photograph, you can see the man with the saw. He's sawing through this log. And the way that that worked was that they would cut through and through and through and through and through the log like this. Now, that had an effect on the planks that came out of the logs because each board had a slightly different property. If you see, this one is completely made of sapwood. Whereas this one has some heartwood and some pith in it as well, even. And so each board is a slightly different constituents of materials inside it. And that means as it dries, it actually curves in different ways. And so the Egyptian carpenters had to be very intelligent about how they used their wood in order to minimize the effects of these curved boards. And as I, as I was saying, if you see the way that they've actually utilized here the curved wood of this tree, it's actually extremely skillful to make such a rectangular shape out of such a curved branch or trunk. And if we look at the rest of the coffin, you see it's exactly the same. So it's probably the same piece of the tree that's been put down Onto, onto this post and then sawn and sawn and sawn through. And it's called, this technique is called through and through sawing. And so the lid has got the same effect on it as well and actually the end pieces have too. If we look at another um, coffin, the coffin of Usahet, this is actually in the Fitzwilliam Museum but again not from Thebes. Um, it comes from Beni Hassan and it's a different type of coffin from slightly later, it's, the, it's a time when they were starting to move to using coffins shaped more like the human body. We would call them anthropoid coffins. This one would have lain, in fact it was found, lying on its side within a rectangular coffin with a, quite a lot of decoration on the outside of that coffin. And we can see that the eyes of this coffin would have been looking out here on the side where the wedge art eyes were and that would have been ideally facing to the east side. The features on the coffin face are very large. So the eyes, the ears and the mouth are all much larger than you would expect um, actually for a naturalized, natural face and probably represent the importance of being able to see and hear 
and breathe in the afterlife and, and are a reflection of the importance of things like the opening of the mouth ritual, which some of you may have heard about. Other important features on this coffin are the text panel which runs down the front and in particular the fact that the person is identified with the god Osiris on this coffin. So this was a point in time at which the ideas about death were changing to some extent. People were no, were no longer going into the afterlife to join Osiris but were becoming Osiris once they had um, gone through the process of transformation. So it's an important coffin in that respect as well. If we look at it from the side, we can see also features that indicate that this, this person, Usahet, had become a king because he is wearing a, a royal beard here. And as we remember, Osiris was the king of the underworld, therefore it's not surprising to see Usahet in the form of a king. Another interesting feature of this coffin, though, is that the decoration was applied on the outside of it once the body was already inside the coffin and sealed. So the coffin was made, the body was put inside, and then the decoration was applied afterwards. So in effect, this coffin was almost like the outermost layer of the wrapping process in the form of the mummification. And so we can therefore understand why maybe it has the anthropoid shape. The coffin was on display for a long time in the Fitzwilliam Museum, unopened. We didn't, hadn't opened it for a very, very long time, until about 2004 or 5, I think it's 4, when we started looking at this. And uh, so the, for, at that point we opened it and examined the two parts of it. And just to get you familiar with the terminology we tend to use, um, this is what we refer to as the lid. This is here. This is the bottom part, which we call the box. And you can see it here. And in fact, here, this is made from, this is made from that's all right, two tree trunks, again from a sycamore fig tree, which were hollowed out like you might make a canoe. So you'd dig out the inside of of the, um, the log to make the box and the lid of this coffin. And in order to do that, you would use something like this, an adze. And we can see again in the tomb of Mecca Ray's carpentry shop, we can see here a group of people using adzes to dig out, um, or to actually use it like a plane almost to shape the wood. But here it's being used actually also to dig out a coffin. So this is the box of the coffin, and as I say, we hadn't opened it for a very long time, and uh, when we opened it and examined it, we were amazed to find that this coffin actually had a big problem. And as we always think to ourselves, there must have been a very bad day at the carpenter's workshop, the day that the side of the coffin fell off. Uh, on, the, on here, and you cannot really see it very well because they repaired it so cleverly. But this is where there's a big crack, and then they stitched it together with four stitches. But from here, it's very difficult to see, and in fact, from the outside, you can't see it at all. So we were absolutely unaware that this coffin had any problems at all. This is a more detailed examination of the coffin, and you can see the stitches are marked here and here. And this is actually a, a close-up of it. And the stitching is made of leather or sinew. And that's a very clever process because it's, it's used quite extensively actually in coffins to join corners together. And we can see, oh, I should say this is another example of another problem. This part of the coffin also fell out and had to be glued back together, probably after this had happened. But if we look at another coffin that we have in our collection, in the corner here, it has been sewn together with the same kind of technique, using this sinew or leather to join it. And the idea is that as the leather dries, or the sinew dries, it pulls the joint tighter and tighter and tighter together until you've got a really good join. And this is a technique they probably also used in shipbuilding in ancient Egypt as well. So we can see how 
this kind of process um, would be a useful one that they'd learned from another resource to, to bring to bear into making coffins. But you're saying to yourselves, why is she not talking about Luxor? So I will now talk about a coffin from Luxor. <coughs> so this is another anthropoid coffin, um, dating to the New Kingdom. And it's in the British Museum, and it's an example of what we refer to as a black coffin. And I think you can see exactly why it's called a black coffin. I'm sorry the picture is not the best picture, but it's very difficult to photograph this coffin. I'm, and I know that because I've tried to photograph it myself. This is the official photograph of it. Um, and you can see the decoration consists of basically a black color with yellow inscriptions on it. Um, and these probably <coughs> reflect an idealized view of how the linen bandages were inside the coffin. There's also a large collar, which we'd actually also seen on the coffin of Usahet, and now a figure of the goddess Nut, which becomes a very common feature of the iconography of these coffins. It's also an anthropoid shape, but now, instead of being designed to be laid on its side, it's designed to lie flat on its back to look up to the sky, a completely different concept. So at the beginning of the New Kingdom, possibly even during the Second Intermediate Period, there was this change of idea for the coffins to lie on their backs instead of to lie on their sides, and perhaps, therefore, to be seen not as the final layer of the mummification process. Who knows? We don't know the answer to that particular question yet. But we were able to examine this coffin while it was um, being prepared to come over to our exhibition from the British Museum, um, we were able to go to the conservation lab in London to, to visit it and to see what was the structure of it from the inside. So this is the lid of the coffin lying face down. And we can see there's a large area of wood that's been added around the rim of this coffin. The main part of it is like the coffin of Usahet. It's a log that's been hollowed out like a canoe again. Um, but then extra pieces have been added. And there's a very interesting structure here because the interior shape is there and then they've added on a large section here and another piece here, I think, of wood as well as this rim that's been created to build up the whole shape of the coffin. And this is a feature we start to see increasingly in coffins, that uh, coffins are made of m multiple pieces of wood joined together to make the correct shape. Another very interesting feature on this coffin is that it was almost certainly created in advance of use by Tamit. Tamit was the owner of it and her name appears here. Um, but if we look at the way the decoration is done, the colour here is much brighter yellow, sort of yellowy orange. We can see even here some marks in red which distinguish the fingers here of this figure. And this decoration is very brightly done in yellow, whereas the name is rather faintly written in different colour yellow paint. And almost certainly this indicates that whoever it was who went to buy this coffin bought a ready-made one. So maybe it was a little bit cheaper. Maybe Tamit's family couldn't afford such a very expensive coffin that was made entirely for her. Who knows? But this is what we would call an off-the-shelf off or off-the-peg coffin. I want to look also at another coffin from Thebes, the coffin of somebody called Muthotep. Um, again, unfortunately, there is only not a great picture in black and white of the entire coffin. Um, but again, we were able to examine it closely. It comes from Thebes, and it's extremely interesting. It's a Ramesside coffin. And there is a lot of yellow color on these coffins because probably as an, uh, an influence that remained from the Amarna period, a lot of the coloration of these coffins perhaps reflects sunlight and uh, the, the, the revivifying processes of the sun bringing people back to life within the coffins. So they are, they are, there's a lot of yellow background color. But if you look carefully here, you can see another interesting feature that underneath this decoration, there is some other decoration here. 
And if we look at the edge of the coffin, this is the lid of it. We see again, here is some decoration, but underneath is completely different decoration. So what happened? What happened to this coffin? Why is it like this? We don't know, is the simple answer. What we can say is that it was made for one person, perhaps, and then somebody else took it and applied new decoration. Or maybe, another possibility is, someone had it made and then they didn't like the decoration and put it aside and then it was used for somebody else later on. We don't know exactly. But it's a fascinating thing. And another thing that we noticed recently um, to, sh to see some uh, reuse or maybe some change in decoration actually relates to the coffin of Yuya, the smallest of the coffins of Yuya in the, in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. We were looking there very recently. We, spent, we had three visits, I think, to Cairo Museum. It was lovely. Um, and uh, we were looking very closely at this particular coffin and noticed here, this is the lid, this is the box of that coffin. Here is the gilded decoration on the outside. And underneath the gilded decoration is some other inscription, which is completely different to the inscription on the outside. So what is this about? Is this someone else's coffin that's been reused? We don't know. Again, we don't know. It'd be very interesting to see um, when some work is done on this, as I'm sure it will be soon, to see what was going on with this coffin. This is, um, the next coffin I want to talk about is the coffin set, a group of coffins, of a man with a very complicated name, Nespawa Shefit. It's a bit of a mouthful. <coughs> it's a group of five pieces of coffin set that came to the Fitzwilliam Museum in 1822. Um, and it's what we would think of as classically a yellow coffin set of the 21st dynasty. It's very early in that period, dating to about 1000 BC. And here is the outer coffin, here is the inner coffin, and here is what we call the mummy board. So Nespawa Shefit's body should have been inside here with this lying on top of it and then the lid over the top, and then all of that would have been inside these two pieces. It was like a, a set of Russian dolls, for example. It's a very beautiful set of coffins. In particular, the inner coffin is amazingly beautifully decorated. The style of the hieroglyphs, the style of the decoration is extremely well achieved. Um, and it's a classic example of what is known as um, horror vacui, the fear of empty spaces on coffins at, these, of the, at this date. So there's nothing, there is virtually no space here that is undecorated or uninscribed. And that's a very classic um, example of that type of coffin. So far this has not been very much published, so at the moment we're working on all our coffins and our current focus is actually on this coffin and another one I will show you in a moment. And we hope that all of these will be available online from the autumn of this year. We're working very hard to get to that point where you'll be able to see these coffins in great detail and also all the analyses that we have done on them and be able to examine them for yourselves and see what you can see for yourselves. One of the famous scenes on it um, shows the weighing of the heart and this has been published before but you can see here the detail again. This is a very small um, piece, it's about, about that big on the, on the coffin itself so it, it, you get a sense of the skill of the artisan who made this. And we have done experiments in recreating these coffins using brushes and pens um, created in the same way as ancient Egyptian pens and brushes were made to see how you do it. And it's incredibly difficult is what I would say. Um, the pigments, we've, we've um, ground up this, the minerals to create, the pigments, we've created Egyptian blue um, to, to try and replicate how these things were done, to look at the skill of the, the artists, and it's immense, actually, really immense, how well this was done. But the biggest problem with it, um, in when you are reproducing it, is to recreate the varnish on the outside, because these coffins are 
brightly varnished with a yellowish varnish that contains a pigment called orpiment, which is highly toxic. And the varnish that goes on the outside, when you try and apply it, it's very, very difficult. And so we really struggled to replicate that and have got nowhere near how the ancient Egyptians did it at all. Another thing that we have done, though, is, is that we have CT scanned this inner coffin. And you can see it here going through the big scanner at our local hospital. We did this on a Sunday morning when no patients were around or caused to wait. We didn't add any waiting time. And you can see us trying to get the thing in the scanner, first of all. And then here we're looking actually at the results of the scans as they are happening. Um, and I've got, I've got various images to show you, and they are quite complex, and I don't know how clearly you will understand what I'm trying to tell you about them. That's not to be patronising, it's just that I find it very hard as well to understand it, so I may not put it over very well. But if we look at the end of the coffin from the outside, we can see here there's a, um, a section of the decoration missing there and there, and we can see some extra pieces of wood, but we're not probably prepared for quite how many pieces of wood there are inside this coffin. This is a slice through the CT scan, and you can see lots and lots of bits of wood in there, and then another slice as we've gone further into it. And, in fact, what we found from this coffin was that, although it appeared to be very um, substantial uh, in the way it was made, actually, when we looked at the CT scans, we found it was full of holes, and there are lots of pieces of wood that actually came from other coffins. It's the only explanation for the shape that they were. So it's um, very much a, um, what we would call in English, a bodged job. <laughs> so this is, um, I'm not going to show you all of this, I just allow you to see how we can look through CT scans of this in three planes simultaneously and see how um, the coffin was built. So there are mortises here which have been recut from another um, side of a coffin and patched here with a piece on the outside to create the right shape. And also this allows us to, um, to view how, it, how the progress of the CT scan goes through there. And we can see different areas of um, spaces where you would not expect there to be spaces. But it is, I think, quite hard to understand. And I'll just run it forward very quickly um, so you can just see for yourselves how it goes. Uh, I'm not going to take all your time with this. But you can see how that works. And you can see all these areas that are blank are just holes that you wouldn't expect to have there. This is another group of images um, taken from our CT scans. Um, and we've been very lucky to work with a consultant radiologist from Addenbrooke's Hospital to understand what we're seeing, because as I said, it's very hard to see at times what it is that you're seeing. We've tried to colour the different elements. So these brown areas are blocks of wood that have been pushed into voids inside the coffin to try and fill them um, when the coffin has been reused. So here is a very complex area. This is the original shape of the coffin side that was used here. And the original mortise hole is here. And you can see, actually, it extends to the outside as it is now. And here is a new mortise hole that has been cut and a patch put onto the outside to create the shape that we see here. So that's what that looks like in the CT scan. And you can see other areas here. This is the central section across here. And this is the foot end. And the blue arrows mark where there is some internal metal that's been put in by somebody to strengthen the coffin itself. But having said all of that, and having said how complex these CT scans are to understand, we found actually a good way to understand what was happening was to use a series of CT scans to create a drawing. And we're very grateful to Dr. Geoffrey Killen for doing this drawing for us. It's like you've cut through the coffin over and over again, so you can see the different things that are happening inside. And here you can see, here is a new mortise hole that would be used to close the coffin up. And here is the old mortise hole that's been filled with a piece of wood and then paste has been put over the top to hide it. 
And you can only see really on the whole the, the new mortise holes and it's using the CT scan that we can actually see what's happening on the inside. The mummy board of this um, coffin is very, very beautiful. It's one of the most fabulous examples of Egyptian art at all, in my view. Um, and there's a feature on here I want to just show you very quickly. And that is that the titles of Nespawa Shefit are in many places highlighted, if you like, by an extra area of varnish that has been applied. And you can see that in many other places. There it is again. It's not the name. His name is fine here. But this area of his job titles has got extra varnish on it. And this is very clear also in this instance. Uh, less clear here. It's very, very smeared, but it's quite difficult to make out. And even on the inside of the outer coffin, we can see the same thing here, actually. And if we go zooming right in to it, we can see a series of horizontal lines, I think, there quite clearly. This is an image taken uh, using a technique known as visible light induced luminescence. It's basically the application of a system of filters that you put onto your camera that allows the visible light, which is what we would think of as, as the best quality of light, shining on it to cause the Egyptian blue to reflect back. And the result is that you see all the Egyptian blue very bright white here, and everything else is a darker image there in black and white. So this is VIL, very useful imaging technique, and we use a lot of imaging techniques to examine our coffins. And what it shows us in this area, there is indeed a, a few of these horizontal lines, as I mentioned there, but there is new writing over the top in Egyptian blue. And having looked all over the coffin for some more examples of these horizontal lines, I did actually find them in a couple of places at the head end of the outer coffin. And it seems to be a title that is read like this. For those of you that read hieroglyphs, it's R R N Mu N Per Amun. That's what we seem to be seeing there. Now, this is a title that, if anybody else here has heard of, please put your hand up because I'd love to know. Um, uh, if there is another example of this title but it's very clear that that's what's written there and I think that that is exactly what's written here we can see here N Per Amun is there and underneath here I think is this series of horizontal lines which gives us N Mu N Per Amun and up here therefore should be R R and in fact if we look very closely at this sign here we can see the tail end of the R sign underneath. So this title, the great one, of the water of the house of Amun is what that reads. And it's, a, as I said, an unusual, unique, it seems, um, title. We can't find it elsewhere. Um, and if colleagues here do find it, please let me know. I'd, I'd love to know. It's been replaced everywhere by new sets of titles. So this is what he really wanted us to see now in his coffins, Nespoa Shefit. So we see here uh, the gods, father of our moon, the Wab, the uh, supervisor, if you like, Harry um, Hemut, the supervisor of craftsmen's workshops, the supervisor of scribes of the temple of the house of our moon. That's what we see now. But what I suspect was originally there was in fact Amun Ra instead of the Wab sign. And instead of Heri Hemut was um, king of the gods, Nisut Netru was probably there. Further down, almost certainly was Aa here. And then instead of this, Hoot, we had Enmu En. Almost certainly that's what it originally said. And we can see examples of this here. As I said, this is very smudged. It's very difficult to see in that area. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you change the titles on a coffin except you had a promotion? Why? So maybe Nespol Shafiq was somebody who was very well organized. He had his coffins made well in advance of his death. Where did they live? Where did these coffins live until he died with his promotion? Who knows? Again, we don't know. 
It's a very interesting question, and it's one we need to think about, is where these coffins were made, where were they stored until they were used, where was the shop that you went into to say, I want that coffin and put my name on it, please? Where were these things? We don't know. These are questions still to be answered, but these are questions that are raised by looking at these coffins in a different way. This is not a wooden coffin. This is a cartonage mummy case from uh, another person who worked at Karnak Temple, which is where Nespoir Shefit worked. He was buried at the Ramesseum. His name is Nachtef Moot. Here's a view of the Ramesseum, and it's just over there. Uh, and it was discovered by Quibel in uh, 19, 1896, intact with Nachtef Moot. It's still inside his <coughs> mummy case. Uh, the case was sawn off at the back, uh, and his body was removed. So we do not have his body, but we have the, the mummy case itself, made of cartonnage. Cartonnage is a material that is very like papier-mâché. Um, it's almost certainly made on the outside of a mud shape, in the shape of a body, uh, with the plaster applied and then layers of linen soaked in animal glue, and then it was allowed to dry until it was until it's held its shape then it was cut open and the mud core was pulled out from the inside and then it could be used for the body to be inserted into it again we have ct scanned this this was done in 2005 so the resolution is slightly less good but we can see the interior here of this mummy case without us having to open it up again you can oops sorry go back you can see here, this is where it was sawn open by Quibel and across the back. And this is the back edge of the, of the opening of the, the mummy case, which would have allowed the body to be pushed inside. So it would have been pulled open there and pushed inside and then filled with plaster. This is modern paste or plaster that was applied by Quibel in order to seal it up after he'd done that. The CT scan also shows the remains of the footboard at the bottom of the coffin, which was applied after the body was put inside. A wooden footboard we put in there, and it would be laced in place. And you can see some of the remains of the lacing here are still visible, and the holes in the wooden footboard there. Um, and that would have the lacing would have gone up the back to seal the, bo the body up inside it. And we can see that the coffin from both sides, and it's beautifully decorated. Uh, Nachtef Moot was clearly somebody who could afford a, a, a pretty fine coffin um, or mummy case here. It would have been inside a series of other plainer coffins, which it seems Quibel didn't keep. Maybe there was not enough decoration on them at the time. He wasn't interested in that kind of coffin. So it never came to, back to the UK. Um, but we can see here that there's gold leaf as well as on the face on some of the, um, the sun disks on top of the birds. Also on the ends of the wig, uh, there is gold as well. Um, beautiful coloration of these um, side birds there. And also the, an unusual feature is that this is also carved. The cartonnage on the outside has a very fine paste layer, very beautifully fine, and that has been carved in relief. And we can see some of the relief here. Um, under very raking light. We can see that quite clearly. The back of the coffin, um, this is the central area. This is where it would have been laced together and then uh, some more paste applied over the top of it. And we can see on the back here is some uh, text from the Book of the Dead. It's actually, for those of you who like to know this, chapter 125 of the Book of the Dead. And some more detail of that. And on the top of this is, very classically, a, a chepa sign, the god of rebirth, the god of coming back to life in the morning, the newborn sun shown on there. And also in relief down the centre of the coffin, we see information about who Nachtef Mut was. And instead of showing us particularly his job titles, he, tell us, he tells us his job titles, and he was the opener of the two gates of heaven. In other words, he opened one of the shrines in the temple at Karnak. Um, but also his father did the same job and his grandfather did the same job and his great-grandfather was um, also an important person in the temple at Karnak. So he's, he's very interested in telling us that uh, who he is is 
all about who his family was, if you like. So Nespoa Sheffit was very keen to tell us his new promoted job was whatever it was. Here we are, Nakhte Root wants to tell us, this is my job. And so it was the same for my father and my grandfather and my great grandfather was very important too. The last coffin I want to talk to you about, I'm probably talking too much, I'm sorry, but I will try to stop. Very bad, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a set of coffins um, that uh, came to the Fitzwilliam Museum in 1869 when the Prince of Wales, as he was at the time, um, visited Egypt as part of a grand tour he was doing with his wife. And he came to Luxor and he received a number of coffins um, some people say that he may have bought them or some people say they were given to him uh, and that included these two coffins of a man called Parkepu and the, all of those coffins were brought back to the UK and distributed around museums in the UK and the Fitzwilliam received these two um, these date to much later um, they are from what we would call the 25th dynasty or possibly the 26th probably late 25th dynasty. But what's interesting about them, again, they, they work in such a way that they were lying one inside the other. So this is the inner coffin, and it would have been inside this coffin. It's possible that this, these two coffins were inside a third coffin. If so, that would have been probably um, a rectangular coffin, but with a vaulted lid and with four posts at the corners. We call those cursory coffins. But it may be that actually this was what we would think of as the coffin of somebody not quite so elevated in society, not so well off as Nespoa Sheffi, not so well off as Nachtef Moot. We also don't know exactly where this pit was in which these coffins were found. So we can't point to anywhere in the necropolis and say that's where that came from. Um, Interesting features of this coffin are that, or this coffin set, let me go back actually, are that this coffin here, let's call it the outer coffin for the moment, uh, this coffin is made up of very, very many pieces of wood. We've done x-raying of this, it's too large to go into a CT scanner, unfortunately, so we cannot CT scan it, so we're relying on x-rays and it's very complex to understand. But all these lines indicate joints in, in pieces of wood. So that's one piece of wood. There's a mortise inside there. These are, ten, um, these are dowels, pegs that hold the, it together. The green is areas of paste. And the paste on this in some areas is like clay. It's a very pinkish color, very heavy material. Um, and it, it's, it's very, what we would say, probably not so not so nice quality as you might see in some other places, but that's maybe putting too much of a, um, a value judgment on it. But this outer coffin is made of over a hundred pieces uh, of wood. If we count all the dowels, then we're looking at around about 150 pieces of wood in the outer coffin box and lid. The inner coffin, though, is completely different. This is the foot end of this coffin, and if you look at that, I think most of the, the colleagues here would probably say this is not, not the best quality of decoration and not the best quality of hieroglyphs, although you can't actually see the hieroglyphs so well on here. Um, we've been looking at this a lot and trying to read the inscriptions and finding that it's very difficult to read it because the, the writing is so poor in a lot of places. And you can see also the way that the decoration has been applied is rather haphazard. The artist has put some marks here for where the lines should go. So he's made these marks and then he's got a, like a ruler to draw the line, a straight edge to draw the line, and he's missed completely. So and the paint has run and all sorts of horrible things have happened. However, in fact, the woodwork underneath this is absolutely beautiful and I will come to that in a moment. You can see those there. If we look also at the face of this coffin, um, you can see very clearly that the paint here was rather thin. And what is clear from looking at the way the decoration was applied was that the man, decor I'm assuming it was a man, decorated standing on this side. So he started here and he leant across to here and across to here and across to here. And then he went round to the other side 
And then he continued these lines here. So that's how he worked on this coffin. And when he got to the face, he didn't have very much red paint left or dark brown paint left. So he added some water and it's just not stuck very well. It's, it's poor quality paint, unfortunately. So there are many issues with these coffins in, as I say, in the decoration. We, we, we really, and the writing of, of the hieroglyphs is, is very difficult to read. But when we CT scanned the inner coffin of this coffin, we were astonished at the quality of the woodworking. If you look at this, this is the base of the, of the box of this coffin. And you see these tight joins here. There's nothing like the voids that you see in the coffin of Nespo or Shefid. But if we look here, you can actually mark them on there. And they're just almost invisible, these joints, on, on the actual work there. It's just such good quality. And if we compare the CT scans of the, the Nespo or Shefid coffin here, the inner coffin there, and the inner coffin of Parkepa, you can see all sorts of pieces of wood and holes, and it's a horrible, horrible jumble of things together, whereas this is beautifully carved, and the whole thing is I I immaculately done. And then you wonder why you would then not put such good decoration on the outside, and that's again an answer, a question we don't have an answer to. What we do know from this coffin is, again, this is a, a coffin that was closed with the body inside it before the decoration was applied. So we can see here on the head of the coffin, very, very clearly, this decoration was done after the coffin was closed and sealed. So it's not what we expect, because a lot of what we know about rituals in, involved in burials is that at some point there was a ceremony known as the opening of the mouth. Um, and that was meant to be happening to the mummy inside, or maybe with the lid removed of the coffin, or maybe before it was put into the coffin. If that's what happened in this case, then the opening of the mouth happened and then the coffin was sealed and then the decoration was applied. It would have to be like that. It's the only way that we can understand it. But if we think back to the cartonage mummy case of Nachtaf Mut, that's the same there. Because that decoration, the outer decoration on the outside of that, of that mummy case, was actually done with their body already inside it. So maybe the inner coffin, that inner mummy case, and here the inner coffin of Parkepu was meant to be like a mummy case, a cartonage mummy case. And there's more reason for thinking that too, because if we look at the structure here of the decorated layers that appear on top of this coffin, it's actually very complex. And we've done a lot of work on that most recently. So we've been looking, if you look here, you can see the way this has cracked as the coffin has been forced open after it was discovered. So the decoration is broken here rather than it being a finished edge. And if we look here, we see a series of layers actually. And we've examined these very closely and discovered that there is indeed a very complicated set of layers of decoration. So this is the wood of the coffin. It's very schematic, obviously. This is the wood of the coffin and this is the inside. So on the inside, immediately next to the wood, is a layer of pink paste. Then there's a layer of linen and glue, which is making a nice surface on the inside. And over the top of that is a, a beautiful white paste, making a nice surface on the inside. But on the outside, it's very different. On top of the wood, we have the pink paste. And then we have a layer of what we call fibrous glue. And it's a very strange type of glue that looks as if it's got pieces of fabric inside it um, but actually what we found just very recently it's been examined and it is actually pieces of leather that have been um, mashed up if you like inside the glue uh, to create a very dense layer over the top of the pink paste over the top of that is another layer of white paste over the top of that is linen with normal glue and then two more layers of paste. And actually, these, the composition of these two layers is different. And then there's a paint layer of the top. So this is actually a complicated structure that we're finding here. We've been working with a, um, a colleague called Charlotte Hunkeler, who's a student, um, who's looking exactly at this. So 
This is very secret, actually. I should tell you this. This is, this is very secret because it's part of her PhD um, that to understand what's going on here and also to try and understand why they were doing this complex layered structure on the outside. But what our best guess is that they were trying to create something like a cartonage mummy case on the outside of the wooden coffin. So if we look at, again, at this, what we are seeing here is the outer coffin shows Parkepu here as a, a man with a short beard. And then up here, we see him as a god with a curved beard inside his mummy case, probably meant to be known as Osiris again, and this is completely curved at the back as well, whereas the outer coffin has a flat base for lying on its back, looking up at the sky. This is curved like a cartonage mummy case. So it's almost like a wooden cartonage mummy case. And as I say, this is possibly meant to look something like this is the Nachtefmut coffin. And why? Why would we do that? Well, this is just a thought. This is off the top of my head, and it, you don't have to believe this at all. But if we look at the, the name for an inner, inner coffin is a suhet. And it's written like this. But the word for an egg is also suhet, without the indication that, it's made, that there's some wood involved in it. So maybe the idea was that you were inside your mummy case like the bird inside the egg waiting to be reborn out of new life. So maybe that's an idea. We don't know. But I hope, anyway, that talking to you about the way these coffins have been made and used and decorated has given you some new thoughts about Egyptian coffins. And shukran. <laughs> <laughs>